I've got a better excuse than usual for this episode of On the Track being late. Guess where we've been? Yeah, the spirit of 1967 is still alive and with us in Wolverhampton of all places because that's where me and Corina and Mother went to film Jefferson Starship. My name's John Downs and welcome to another episode of On the Track. Regular viewers will probably have realised by now that there's quite a few new faces at the CFZ at the moment, like Mark Rains. Hello, viewers. And Kobe, who may only be eight years old, but he's the new CFZ gardener and he's doing a damn good job having taken over from Jenny, who retired last year. We put an advert in the village shop asking for a responsible teenager, and we had a phone call from a guy called Dave who said... My son isn't a responsible teenager, but he's a responsible eight-year-old. He wanted some money for something, and I told him that if he wanted money, he'd have to earn it. So he wants a job, but being only eight years old, there are very few jobs that he can do. However, and here I'm paraphrasing, the CFZ is notorious for having a loose interpretation, shall we say, of government legislation. And so, as Dave promised to come along too every time that Kobe comes to do the gardening, we took the pair of them on. And I'm pleased to say that the garden looks better now than it has any January or February since we moved here. Well done, guys. And this is Saskia. You met her several times. First of all, about 18 months ago, when she was only 14, and she came and did a week's work experience with us. But now she's back, which shows she must be as mad as the rest of us, because she's here for a long-term placement as part of her animal husbandry course at the local college. And she also comes here working and paid, yes, she's one of the few people who actually gets paid by the CFZ every Wednesday afternoon. And goodness me, she is very much worth it. Here she's cleaning the Sicilians. As you know, we have a colony of Sicilians. What are Sicilians, you ask? I thought you knew. Here we have a Sicilian. It's from the genus Geotrepides. They are found in tropical regions of Southeast Asia, Africa, South America, and the Seychelles Islands. There are about 167 species in the world. And you can see that they superficially resemble earthworms or snakes. Highly superficially, yeah, they don't actually look anything like snakes and they're the weirdest looking earthworms you can ever see. A lot of them live underground, or semi-underground, like these species. But the ones we have are from Venezuela, the Rio Corco River to be more precise, and they're known as Typhlonectes natans, the Rio Corco Sicilian. These are our Rio Corco Sicilians being fed by Graham, who looks after them on a daily basis. He's actually really rather fond of them, and finds their feeding frenzy perennially fascinating. Yes, we do feed them on live food, yes, we do feed them on worms, but no, we are not taking earthworms out of our garden and the increasingly beleaguered ecosystem of North Devon. These are Dendrobina composting worms, which we buy each time from the fishing tackle shop in Westwood Ho. They're bred to be eaten by fish, so we fed to feed them to Sicilians. Either way, they're still fulfilling their destiny. Well, what exactly are Sicilians? Within the aquarist industry, their trade name for this particular species is rubber eel, but they're not made of rubber and they're certainly not eels. Earlier they were described as looking like snakes or worms, but they're not snakes and they're certainly not worms. They're actually a type of very primitive, specialised, legless amphibian. There are two well-known groups of amphibians, the cordata, or tailed amphibians, and the anura, or tailless amphibians. 
But the Sicilians, or Gymnophona, are a third group. Why do we keep them? Apart from the fact, of course, that I find them endlessly fascinating. And I'm the boss, and if I find something fascinating, I can usually get away with keeping it. There are, believe it or not, several bona fide cryptozoological aspects to these endlessly fascinating little creatures. It has been suggested, for example, that several of the well-known cryptids of South America and parts of Asia, the fossorial creatures such as the Minhoako and even the Buru, may well be hitherto unsuspected species of giant Sicilian. At the moment, the largest species of Sicilian known to science is just over a metre in length. But could they grow larger? Quite possibly. There is very little doubt that new species of Sicilian will be discovered because they are being discovered with monotonous regularity, particularly in India. But there is one particularly intriguing Sicilian related mystery which has intrigued me and Max Blake for the last four or five years. Look at these. They are obviously much bigger than the Sicilians that we have got in our collection. But these larger Sicilians, which are supposed to be something like 18 inches to 2 foot long, and as thick round as my thumb, maybe even thicker, are being exhibited in various collections around the world as Typhlonectes natans. Well, they're far bigger than our Typhlonectes natans, or the ones at London Zoo, or the ones that were at Doral Wildlife in Jersey. We know that ours are not juvenile specimens because they've bred three times. So are there two different size morphs of Typhlonectes and Atans, or are there actually two different species? We want to find out. The precise specific identity of a small worm-like amphibian may not be of any interest to most people, but I find it endlessly fascinating. This year we hope to be getting a hold of one or more of the species of Fossorial Sicilian, like the ones we saw earlier in the show. Richard and I kept one for a brief time over ten years ago. He was only with us for a short time, but he was a fascinating little chap, and we think we know where we went wrong, so we want to try again soon. If anybody in the UK or Europe comes across for Sorrel Sicilians and a local dealer, please let me know. Or if you have some surplus to your collection and want to get rid of them, or want to sell them, please contact us without delay. I have this fond and rather nice little fantasy that within the next few years we'll have breeding colonies of half a dozen different species of Sicilian and that we'll be able to do something really good towards adding to the sum total of human knowledge of these wonderful but very cryptic and little known creatures. But talking of the CFZ menagerie, what's Saskia doing? During the summer of 2012 I bought Karina a frog. An Indian chubby frog, to be precise. And she named it Chubby Checker. At this point, I think we should point out to those young enough not to know what on earth we're talking about, that Chubby Checker was a pop star of the early 1960s, who had a very famous hit with a song called Let's Twist Again. Also, apparently, Mr Checker does not like people exploiting his name, image or intellectual property, so I hope he doesn't mind that we named a frog after him. The Asian Painted Frog, otherwise known as the Banded Bullfrog, or in the pet trade, the Chubby Frog, because it's A, a frog, and B, chubby, so I suppose that makes some sort of sense, is widely kept as a pet. Tens of thousands of them are imported into Europe and America each year. And although they are widespread in the wild, and even in invasive species in some places, one would assume that taking so many each year from the wild is not going to be sustainable in the long run. Taken from the wild, you say? Aren't they bred in captivity? Well, as far as I can gather, hardly ever. Now, I want to do this for several reasons. Firstly, so we can publish on how to breed them in captivity, which may stop a little of the trade in wild-caught animals but also because there are various species of frogs, some of which are cryptids, that we do want to study. And being great devotees of the work of the late Joel Dole, if we're going to keep something in captivity, we are determined to breed it. And we'd very much like to learn how to breed these creatures, which in the wild will only reproduce at the beginning of the monsoon season, in torrential tropical downpours. 
This is a rain chamber, a specialised bit of kit used to simulate tropical rainstorms inside a closed vivarium environment in order to breed tropical animals which rely upon rainstorms in order to reproduce. Graham doesn't know yet, but he's just about to build us one. Chubby sings for a mate, which implies that he's probably male. And one would hope that he would not sing for a mate if he wasn't sexually mature and able to breed. Hopefully this year we'll see the pitter-patter of tiny tadpoles. But I haven't answered the question I asked in the beginning, what's Saskia doing? Well, we're rearranging the frog and toad enclosures, or frog and toad accommodation, I should say. And since the old Rayburn, which has been in this house since the 1930s, finally packed up earlier last year, what used to be the kitchen range that my mother made bread in has now become a plinth on which the frog and toad vivariums are neatly stacked. So that's what Saskia is doing. I hope it all made sense in the end. Well, as I told you in the last episode, the two kittens, Lilith Tinkerbell and Captain Phenobulax the Magnificent, that's him here, peeking out from the back door, are allowed out now. Captain Phenobulax is the bolder of the two, and has fairly readily grasped the idea that he has to go outside in order to get rid of his waste products. However, He's peeking rather gingerly, if that's not too bad a pun, considering he's a ginger cat, out of the back door here because it's cold, wet and grey. His sister is already outside, sniffing around where we put the bin bags, but even she looks like it's time to go back indoors again. Both of the kittens are enjoying their newfound freedoms, but they're quite sensible enough to realise that it's cold, wet and grey outside and there's much more fun to be had indoors cuddling their grandmother. Or teasing the dogs. Or having what Richard would describe as a fat old sleep. Or catching titbits off whoever happens to be in the kitchen. Or any one of the other hundred and one things which two enterprising young kittens can do with their lives. And so at the moment they don't go outside for any great length of time, which is probably sensible because this last month has been the wettest January on record. And although the signs of spring are beginning to show in the garden now, a few days before Valentine's Day, I'm wondering what the effect of all this terrible weather has been on this year's wildlife. 2013 was the best year for many years for British butterflies, both the native species and for vagrants from overseas. Changing the subject for a second, I know that we talked about the long-tailed blues a few episodes ago. They're a species which is found across the globe, but only rarely gets to Britain, and even rarer breeds here. It was the 1940s that was the last major year for long-tailed blues in Britain, but 2013 was a spectacular year. From the summer right through to the autumn, they were living and breeding right across the south coast, and it has been suggested that anything up to 10,000 of them managed to get to these shores. Because they are a continuously brooded species that doesn't hibernate, there is no way it will have survived the winter, mild though it has been. And so, unfortunately, this beautiful species is likely to only ever arrive here by accident and stay for a few months. However, I can't remember if I told you about this or not, but just before the end of last year, Another exciting vagrant was found this time in the Shetland Islands. The yellow-legged tortoise shell, also known as the scarce tortoise shell, is on the British list, but only just. A single female specimen was caught in shipboard near Sevenoaks in West Kent on the 2nd of July 1953. This species is resident in Central and Eastern Europe, and, the migra and it is a migrant which has also been sighted in Finland, Denmark, Germany and Sweden. It's believed that the individual seen in Kent could feasibly have occurred as a natural migrant rather than an accidental introduction. This specimen was found at the end of November in a pile of wood imported from Norway. This, I'm afraid, would imply that it is not a natural vagrant, and in fact it came here through man-made means. This is a long way from saying that it's a fake or a fraud, of course it's not. 
but it came here by accidental importation by humankind, rather than on its own volition. Pity, because unlike the long-tailed blue, this is a species which does hibernate, and if it was to occur in the UK in enough numbers, by accident or by design, it might well become established. There is a niche here, after all, for it. Sadly, these days in the United Kingdom, there's only one species of tortoiseshell known to live and breed here, the small tortoiseshell, Aglis urticae. This is a creature which has suffered very badly in recent years, and until the recovery of 2013 was thought by many people to be headed for extinction. After all, it's already happened once. In the 1950s, its cousin, the large tortoiseshell, did become extinct in the UK. Or did it? The large tortoiseshell was once a common British species, especially in the south of England. But in the middle of the 20th century, it began to decline. There was a brief resurgence of the species just after the Second World War, but by the 1950s and 1960s it was in serious trouble, and it is generally believed to have become extinct sometime in the 1970s. However, they still get seen with monotonous regularity. Each year, three or four of these delightful insects are seen, usually on the south coast of England and quite often in one particular copse on the Isle of Wight. They've also been seen on many occasions in my old stamping ground of Dawlish Warren in South Devon, although I have to admit that while I was living there, between 1981 and 1985, I never saw any. A few years ago it was even claimed that they had bred in a property owned by the National Trust in South Devon. Many researchers now believe that the species either never completely became extinct or is successfully beginning to recolonise its past areas. Either way, this is cryptozoology in action. For those of you who are interested in the concept of cryptozoology and can't afford or don't be bothered to go all the way over to the Himalayas to look for the Yeti, this is a cryptozoological research project that you can do in the United Kingdom. But back to Woolser in the late winter of 2014. It's been raining solidly for weeks. And there's been hardly any frost and no snow at all. It's a well-known fact that some plants and insects do need to have a period of freezing weather in order to fill their life cycle efficiently. Last year we were lucky because although it was late, we did have the frozen weather, and last year was, as I've said already, a spectacular year for British butterflies. What's going to happen this year? One assumes that the appalling weather isn't going to last indefinitely, and we're going to have some periods of sunshine. But will the warm, wet winter have taken its toll upon the Lepidoptera? Are we going to see another beautiful year of butterflies like we did last year? Or is the general decline of British Lepidoptera going to continue? We're doing our best to make the garden butterfly friendly, but we can't legislate for the weather. And we're totally helpless in the face of the storms and rain which have characterised 2014 so far. Hopefully soon we'll be a change in the weather. But that's enough of the doom and gloom for this month. I think it's time to go over to my lovely wife Karina and our regular monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird. A highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other old world raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment upon the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. On the 5th of January,
January, a grey phalarope was seen at a small children's paddling pool along the Hove seafront. A passage visitor, this bird breeds in Greenland, Iceland, northern Siberia and North North America and winters in the southern oceans south to Antarctica. It lives on coastal tundra and on migration sea coasts. Its diet consists of invertebrates and also plant material, especially seeds, on its arrival on breeding grounds. When we, when we see it in Britain, it is in its winter dress, known as the grey phalarope, but further north on its breeding grounds, it is known more accurately as the red phalarope due to its breeding plum plumage. It was first seen here in 1757 in Yorkshire. An American coot was at Loch Flemington Highland during the month of January. It is the first record for Britain for around nine years and the second for the Scottish mainland. It is an accidental visitor and lives on lakes, marsh, rivers and sea coasts where it feeds mostly on aquatic plants. The dogs determined to ruin this. It also in eats insects such as beetles and dragonflies, as well as crustaceans, snails and small vertebrates such as tadpoles and salamanders. It was first recorded here in 1996 in Kent. They are closer relatives to the sandhill crane than the rails and the likes of mallards and teal, and they are found throughout North America, south to northern South America. Now the cats are playing behind Graham. On the 19th of May, no, on the 19th of the month, came the discovery of the first ever Pacific diver or loon for Ireland, seen on Loch Fay, County Tyrone. An accidental visitor, this bird breeds in the Arctic coast of eastern Siberia and north North America, and winters south to eastern China and southwestern USA. It favours deep lakes and eats fish and aquatic invertebrates was first recorded here in 2007 in North Yorkshire. It was most abundant it is the most abundant loon in North America and spends most of the year in the Pacific Ocean. Not in the Pacific Ocean, on the Pacific Ocean. It returns inland to Arctic tundra lakes in the summer to breed for about three months. Like other loons, this bird walks extremely awkwardly on land and cannot take flight from land at all. It requires about 30 to 50 metres of open water to take flight, flapping and pattering across the surface. There was late news of a first for Britain seen in Cumbria at Tolkien Tarn on December the 22nd. Named after Martin Wilhelm von Mant, who was a German physician and naturalist back in the 19th century, a Mant's black guillemot was definitely a surprise find. It is the northern subspecies of the black guillemot of the North Atlantic. They usually nest on rocky ledges and feed on small fish, crustaceans and mollusks. The pick of the last week of January was a yellow-browed warbler in Uffmore Wood in Worcestershire on the 27th. A passage visitor, this breeds in northern and central Asia and the Near East and winter south to southern Asia. It lives in open forest, woodland and scrub and feeds mostly on insects, usually in tree canopy but also in herbs on the ground. It was first recorded in Britain in Northumberland in 1838. On the 28th, two shore larks, or horned lark as they're known in the United States, were seen on the 28th of the month. They are a scarce breeder here, but are known to be a winter visitor. They are found in Europe, North Africa, Northern and Central Asia and North America. They live on dry plains, tundra and open shores, and in the summer feed on insects and some seeds, and in the winter on seeds alone. The first record here was in Norfolk in 1830, and the first breeding record was in 1977 in northwest Scotland. The highlight of the 25th was the discovery of a very rare Humes yellow browed warbler, also known as Humes leaf warbler, at Coles Hill in Warwickshire, and is a first for the county, and only the second for the West Midlands area. Following one at Westport Lake, Staffordshire, on the 20th of December 1994. It breeds on ground nests in mountain woodland, in the mountains of Central Asia and winters mainly in India. And it feeds on insects. Don't start snoring. The highlight of the 15th was the discovery of a Ross's gull in County Dublin at North Bull Island. This is an accidental visitor to our shores and breeds in Western Greenland, Northern Siberia, Northern North America and winters in the Arctic Oceans along the pack ice. 
It lives on Arctic coasts, swampy tundra and is otherwise pelagic. In the summer, it feeds mostly on insects, but in the winter, probably invertebrates and fish close to the surface of the water. Its breeding grounds were only found in 1905 and its wintering range is still poorly known. The record here was in Shetland in 1936. The first record, that is. This bird was unknown in the continental United States until one appeared in Massachusetts in 1975. Significant late news came in on the 15th of the month, which confirmed that the white-winged white -winged scoter seen at Musselburgh and Lothian on the 26th of December last year was a Stainager's scoter. Now there's a couple of ways of pronouncing that and I just picked the easiest one. This is the first British record of this form, following one in Ireland at the Rossbys Strand, County Kerry on the 1st of February to the 11th of April 2011. Unfortunately though I cannot find any other information about the subspecies with regard to its breeding, wintering and feeding habits etc. And so that is it for this month and now it's over to John for the regular look at Yuri and Regis Scottish Goodbye. A new species of big whale has been described based on the study of seven animals stranded on remote tropical islands in the Indian and Pacific Oceans over the past half century. Beak whales, a widespread but little known type of toothed whale distantly related to sperm whales, are found in deep ocean waters beyond the edge of the continental shelf throughout the world's oceans. They are rarely seen at sea due to their elusive habits, long dive capacity and the apparent low abundance of some species, said Dr. Meryl Dallabout, the international team leader, understandably most people have never heard of. The first person of the new species was a female found on the Sri Lankan beach more than 50 years ago. On the 26th of January 1963, a 4.5 metre long blue-grey beak whale washed up at Ratamanala near Colombo. The then director of the National Museum of Ceylon, Mr. Paulus Dedian Vergala, described it as a new species and named it Mesopladon hutala after the local Singala word for pointed beak. However, two years later, other researchers reclassified this specimen as an existing species, Mesoplodon ginkodens, named for the tusk-like teeth of the adult male that are shaped like the leaves of a ginkgo tree. Now it turns out that Derengiala was right, even though regarding the uniqueness of the whale he identified, whilst it is closely related to the ginkgo-toothed beaked whale, it is definitely not the same species, says Dr. Delapad. Scientists in Brazil have discovered the first new river dolphin species since the end of World War I. Named after the Araguaia River, where it was found, the species is only the fifth known of its kind in the world. Writing in the journal PLOS One, the researchers say it separated from other South American river species more than two million years ago. There are believed to be about a thousand of the creatures living in the Araguaia River Basin. River dolphins were amongst the world's rarest creatures. According to the IUCN, there are only four known species at the moment, and three of them are on the red list, meaning that they are critically endangered. However, the classification of the river dolphins is a matter for debate, and it was claimed a few years ago that a new species had been found in Colombia. Other experts believe that it was merely a new subspecies or even a new race. There does not seem to be any doubt, however, that this new species is exactly what is claimed for it. Researchers have described a new species of toad that lives under dead leaves in the Peruvian Yungas. The toad, Irunella Yunga, was named after its habitat. The word loosely translates to warm valley in English. The newly baptised toad species belongs to the family of Bufonidae. Toads are known for their thick, watery skin. Bufonidae has 34 genera and can be found all over the world except for certain regions of Australia and of course the Antarctic. Toads have large poison parotid glands in the back of their heads. They release the poison when they're stressed. Rihanna Yunga has a unique colour that resembles dead foliage. The toad also has bony protrusions that help it look like dead leaves, securing its camouflage. The newly described to toad also lacks a tympanic membrane or eardrum, which is a round part of the hearing organ. The membrane is usually seen on both sides of a toad's head. 
it appears that large numbers of still unnamed cryptic species remain hidden under some nominal species of the Rhinella Markalafera species group, explained Dr. Shure Morovich of the National Museum in Prague in the Czech Republic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for watching. That's about it for this episode. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's helped, particularly Saskia, Dave Braun Phillips, Graham Inglis, and my lovely wife, Karina. It's actually not Karina on camera today, it's actually Dave. Hi, Dave! Hello! <laughs> and it's just like the old days, me and Dave prattling around in the, in the office and making stupid videos again. And it's a time, it's... The times I have with Dave still are times I value very much indeed. This year is shaping up to be a very exciting one, so in the next month's episode we're going to have lots of exciting news on the weird weekend about our book schedule for the year and all sorts of other things. Sorry if we're so late this time, we'll try to be back on time again next month. Don't bail on it. So until then, we'll see you again.